I'm Richard Garwin. I have a PhD in physics from 1949, working with Enrico Fermi at the University of Chicago. I uh, then worked summers for many years at Los Alamos, uh, developing nuclear weapons and uh, procedures for testing them, including the first hydrogen bomb tested November 1, 1952. Uh, the end of that year, I moved to the IBM company for their research division and almost immediately spent half uh, the time for a year or so with a group of scientists at Harvard and MIT on air defense of the United States and Canada. So I was introduced uh, not only to the technology of nuclear weapons, but also to the numbers, to the hazard, havoc that they would cause, and uh, to the desire to limit uh, their numbers and reduce the possibility of their use. So it uh, didn't take long, really, after 1953, uh, before I was working with the President's Science Advisory Committee in Washington and uh, trying to help first uh, the Eisenhower administration with the President's Science Advisory Committee and then the Kennedy administration obtain a comprehensive uh, nuclear weapon test ban. In fact, the Conference of Experts in 1958 in Geneva uh, said that uh, one can really detect atmospheric tests, and uh, very soon after, the United States deployed satellites for detecting space tests and tests in the atmosphere, and had been uh, collecting debris from atmospheric tests. So it only took until 1963, it seemed to take a long time, uh, to get the limited test ban treaty medium test band, and uh, that was signed uh, by the United States, uh, the Soviet Union, and the United Kingdom, and then later opened for uh, a signature by other countries. But the underground test ban took a long time, uh, simply because it's much more complicated uh, to distinguish underground tests from the earthquakes, and in particular, in 1959, the idea of hiding uh, reducing the signature of nuclear tests by detonating the explosion in a pre-existing cavity, air-filled cavity, uh, slowed down the inclusion of underground tests as the fourth medium. So it took until 1996 before people were fairly confident that we could detect underground tests. There was a group of seismic experts that was convened and did major work on that even before the treaty was signed and then really developed uh, the technology that's incorporated into the international monitoring system. So that was uh, really picked up and <coughs> very well uh, forwarded by the CTBTO. And uh, what has been uh, different from 1950s is the digital technology of storage and transmission and integrity of uh, instruments that has worked out very well and the ability to process with computers on a scale that wasn't imaginable 50 years ago. Yes, I think that uh, CTBT is effectively verifiable in that uh, tests that are of military significance will be picked up and that the uh, product of the uh, International Monitoring System and the IDC, International Data Center, uh, supplemented by national technical means, will support uh, the call for on-site inspection, that if a nuclear test takes place and an on-site inspection is performed, there's very high probability of finding the test through leakage of radioactive materials, fission products from the test, and even drilling back into the cavity produced by the underground nuclear explosion. So, uh, but is it perfectly verifiable? No, uh, because it bans all nuclear explosion tests of whatever yield. You could have a firecracker like, and I do mean a gram of high explosive or 10 grams of high explosive, and uh, that would be uh, detonated in a pressure vessel and would not be detected at all uh, by physical means. But it could be detected by other means. Somebody could be talking about it, for instance. Uh, somebody who was involved might not like the idea 
that his or her country was violating its obligations under the CTBT. Decoupling uh, came as a shock uh, to the scientists uh, in the United States with an invention uh, by Albert Latter in January of 1959. And in fact, Hans Bethe, a great physicist from Cornell University, uh, who was uh, on the conference of experts, had the job of first understanding it. He doubted it, but uh, when he actually performed the calculations, he saw that it was possible. The idea is to have a very large air-filled cavity in the rock or salt. And uh, if it was big enough, then the pressure of the explosion on the walls of the uh, cavity would only deform the material elastically. So it would push it out, and uh, the pressure in the cavity would be only about 200 atmospheres, uh, about 3,000 pounds per square inch which is well within the uh, strength of, of rock, so it wouldn't crush. And if the uh, cavity is deep enough so that the pressure of the rock keeps the rock from being put into tension, uh, then it will hold. And if it's deep enough so that the water pressure in any cracks in the rock exceeds the cavity pressure, uh, then the gases will not leak out. So uh, that's a theoretical construct. It was then demonstrated to be valid by a, an experiment in a nuclear explosion produced cavity. So that's a convenient way of getting a spherical cavity of reasonable size. So a very small, low yield nuclear explosive was detonated in a cavity from a bigger uh, nuclear explosive. And in fact, uh, the amplitude was reduced by about the expected factor of 70. So a one kiloton shot has about the same seismic uh, magnitude as if it were 15 tons only. So uh, that was a great blow to the idea of detecting uh, nuclear explosions down to a range of a kiloton or so, a thousand tons, uh, toward the lower end of the militarily useful range. But uh, we now understand considerably better the radius of the cavity was always uh, said to be about 25 meters to decouple one kiloton. And to decouple a yield bigger than that, the volume of the cavity would have to increase. So for a yield of eight kilotons, the volume would have to be eight times larger, the radius twice as large, 50 meter radius. 50 meters is a lot. <laughs> 100 meter diameter, uh, the length of a, uh, a football field. And that has to be a sphere, more or less. Actually, we now know that it doesn't have to be quite spherical, but has to be at sufficient depth as well. So there are uh, many uh, cavities that have been produced uh, in salt, particularly by solution mining. Uh, salt is very good because it flows plastically, and so it doesn't have the cracks and joints that exist in ordinary rock. But large salt deposits, not bedded salt, which is uh, not nearly so competent, uh, but the so-called diapores, uh, which are salt that has been extruded and uh, purified in the process. Those are well located because of the petroleum industry. And uh, all the large cavities are known pretty well, too. Now, making a cavity like that in rock is very difficult. It's a lot of mining. You have to take out the material. It has to be quite deep. Making it in salt uh, by solution mining is more feasible. But the main point is that the uh, international monitoring system, and in particular the thousands of independent seismometers from research institutes and universities throughout the world, have a much better detection capability than one kiloton. At the uh, various test sites at Novaya Zemlya or Lapnor, or uh, Nevada test site in the United States, the detection capability from seismometers alone is more in the order of a few tons than it is in the kiloton range. So even multiplying by 70, uh, you could uh, perhaps have some cap capability of evading detection with a test of half a kiloton, which would then 
look like 170th much, so maybe six or eight tons, uh, but there's still a probability of getting caught. And typically, a test series requires just that, a series of tests, uh, every one of which needs to escape detection. Uh, to uh, have a decoupled explosion away from the test site, the uh, threshold of detection is higher. And so one could probably, if one could find a suitable cavity, produce a suitable cavity clandestinely, one could probably explode something in the uh, kiloton or two kiloton range and uh, not have it detected with high probability. But it would be detected with some probability. And there are other ways for detection as well. Furthermore, nobody has ever uh, detonated a nuclear explosive in a, uh, an artificial cavity made other than in salt with a nuclear explosion. So we don't really know what would happen on the large scale in a solution mined cavity in salt or a, a mechanically mined cavity in rock. After the explosion, uh, experience shows that there, uh, is, there are aftershocks, there's falling rock, uh, which can be detected. And there are always the other means of detection, uh, namely uh, leakage of radioactive materials, uh, normal intelligence, human intelligence, other types of information. So when we looked at this for uh, the purpose of understanding United States security with and without a comprehensive test ban treaty, uh, most publicly in a 2002 report of the National Academies of Sciences, of which I was a member together with Raymond Jeanlon and Paul Richards, both at this meeting, and uh, three directors of U.S. Uh, nuclear weapons laboratories were also members of the authoring committee. And uh, we decided that it was much more in the United States' interest uh, to eliminate the testing of uh, nuclear explosives worldwide than to A, maintain the ability for ourselves to test uh, because we could take care of our nuclear weapons without testing and uh, the amount of uh, testing by other countries that could escape notice would not be militarily significant. A lot can be done under the CTBT as it stands. Uh, one might include uh, satellite means of verification, but those can be provided by the uh, national data centers, uh, technical, uh, national technical means, and used to support a call for on-site inspection or just to supplement the information available uh, to the CTBTO. What, uh, where we have a real problem, though, is entry into force, because the treaty uh, requires that 44 nations sign and ratify those that had nuclear facilities. And uh, we have six ratification missing from the signatories, and three states, uh, India, Pakistan, and North Korea, that are not members of the CTBT. And yet, uh, it would be good for it to enter into force, even if those three, or some of the three, did not agree. So I think that now the treaty allows consideration of other means of entry into force, and it's time to consider that. I think that sometimes a member state uh, should authorize uh, CTBT to release information as promptly as it can. But the information CTBTO has is uh, not necessarily the most relevant for protection of the public. Certainly, things like tsunami warnings, yes, because uh, th that information is available before the tsunami strikes, typically. And earthquake warnings, uh, so, but countries that are subject to earthquakes, for the most part, have their own warning networks. Uh, but that could be useful in a prearranged fashion. Now, for radiation releases, uh, we have reactor accidents. We've had wind scale in the UK. We had Three Mile Island in the United States, Chernobyl in the Soviet Union in, uh, in the Ukraine at the time. And uh, there it would have been very good to have earlier data on the release of 
radioactive material. That's the responsibility for the state. It should abide by that responsibility. And uh, in the most recent case of, of Fukushima Daiichi, uh, the government has said that it erred in not uh, releasing the information to the public more quickly. But it's not, in my opinion, wouldn't make much difference uh, for a CTBTO to release the information that it had. It's not only the magnitude of the release, but the nature of the radioactivity, uh, where, it, where it was deposited by prevailing winds and rain. And uh, I do believe that the world as a whole, not necessarily CTBTO, should improve the capability to respond to such accidents. And uh, my own recommendation is that we use a, a fleet of tiny uh, drone aircraft, which might weigh only 10 kilograms or so, uh, that could be uh, carried in commercial airplanes to wherever the accident has occurred, and would now fly at a few hundred meters above the terrain in, uh, to detect uh, the radioactive contamination level. And uh, this could help greatly to uh, define the areas where people should not stay or should be confined to their homes. That would be for a case of uh, terrorist attack with a radiological dispersal device or for a uh, nuclear explosion, uh, accidental or intentional, or for uh, an accident or an attack on a power reactor or reprocessing plant. So we need that, those data, we need them more rapidly, and we need them in an accessible form, so uh, these data should be uh, validated on, uh, online by GPS, populated into a database uh, that anybody could access. So I'm going to try to, to have that done, but not through CTBTO. It would be more an IAEA uh, function, uh, that is the safety of uh, nuclear power responding to nuclear accidents. Uh, but the IAEA has not been set up for this purpose, and there may be problems involving it. I think that uh, a multilateral agreement among some major countries to develop such a capability and to share it uh, would be the better way to go.